Hi everybody, welcome to Elementary Classical Mechanics, the subject where observing the universe suggests new mathematical and computational approaches that can literally transform our way of modeling and predicting any aspect of the world. Hi everybody, in this lecture I want to give an overview for the setting for this course. So why mechanics and mathematics? To answer such a question, it's useful to go back and look at the giants who created this field. So we start off with Joseph Fourier. Fourier developed Fourier analysis, and you are going to see that occur in many varied contexts during the course of your studies, whether it be mathematics or engineering or physics. So Fourier developed Fourier analysis in the context of study of, of heat conduction, Newton's equations for heat conduction in around 1820 or so. And Fourier states that uh, studying nature is a very fruitful way for finding mathematical discoveries or making mathematical discoveries. And the power of mathematics, you can see the quote below, is that it looks at very different diverse phenomena and sees the analogies and links between them. But most importantly, it enables you to develop predictive tools once you discover these links. And we're going to see that throughout this course. So Fourier, during his time, had no inkling of quantum mechanics or mathematical finance, probably. But... Fourier analysis plays a fundamental role, or it has played a fundamental role in the development of quantum mechanics, and it plays a fundamental role to this day. And you can see in the book cover on the right that it plays a role in mathematical finance, which is you might find somewhat surprising. But by the time you get through this course, you'll hopefully you'll see that such analogies are really not surprising. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci has one of my favorite quotes on mathematics and mechanics. Mechanics is a paradise of the mathematical sciences because by means of it, one comes to the fruits of mathematics. So what will we study in this course? Well, the life work of three men will make up the bulk of what we study. Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. And they're all linked to, in terms of what they did. They all built upon each other's work. Galileo first, Kepler, and then Newton. Tied up a lot of the loose ends, made things mathematical, and gave us the framework which um, f forms the foundation for many mechanical theories today. So we all know about Newton, Newton's celebrated three laws of motion. We're going to learn how to use those in this course. More precisely, we're going to le learn how to turn these words into mathematical models, equations, in specific physical settings. So it's interesting to look at some, the giants who developed this subject. Galileo and Newton, and it's good to recall, it's always been curious to me, and Spongebob reminds us that Galileo died in the same year that Newton was born. And then we have Lagrange and Hamilton, who developed generalizations of uh, reformulations of Newton's equations, which brought out different aspects of, um, of mechanics. Lagrange's formulation highlighted the role of symmetries and led the mathematician Emmy Noether to her famous uh, theorem on symmetries, Noether's theorem. Hamilton developed a formulation of mechanics which played a fundamental role in the development of quantum mechanics. Maxwell developed the equations for electromagnetism, electrodynamics, 
And Einstein, we, we know about him and special and general relativity and the foundations of quantum mechanics, among other things. So I want to talk a little bit about books, not textbooks for the course, but the top row are classic books in the development of this topic, and they are really fundamental um, monuments to human creation in some sense. So the book on the left is Galileo's book on, um, on dialogues on two world systems, roughly. Um, he wrote this in lockdown, I believe, not COVID-19 lockdown, but he was under house arrest for um, espousing ideas that uh, the Catholic Church did not agree with at the time. The book immediately to the right is Newton's famous Principia, where he wrote down his famous three laws of motion, which actually Galileo had the first law. Lagrange's famous Mécanique Analytique, the third book from the left, is Formulation of Lagrange's Equation. And the last book on the, from the left, the book on the right, is Poincaré's uh, first volume of his three-volume set on new methods in celestial mechanics. It's a book where you can actually learn quite a bit of Hamiltonian dynamics and celestial mechanics. Um, even today. It's a wonderful book. The other three books are more of a historical note, I believe, but I wanted to point them out. The book on the books on the bottom are a little bit different. The book on the left of Mach, Science and Mechanics, has played a fundamental role. It's not really a textbook. I enjoy reading certain sections about what is inertia, what is mass, what are coordinate frames some time ago. It's, it's not easy reading, and unless you're really interested in seeing how the minds of great scientists work, and Mach, Mach's book was of some influence to Einstein in his development of general relativity, it's, 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 it has great historical import, but probably not as much today. The next book is one of my favorites. This is the book of Sommerfeld, Arnold Sommerfeld on mechanics. It's not a very popular book, and it's not so well known. I don't think you could use it to teach a course, but I've learned a lot from this book. Sommerfeld was a great teacher. He had uh, at least three students who went on to win Nobel Prizes, three postdocs who also went on to win Nobel Prizes. He, he educated many of the greatest mathematical physicists of the 20th century. He wrote a series of books mechanics, optics, mechanics of deformable bodies, thermodynamics. This has tremendous insight. I learned a lot about variational methods, uh, work, transformation, Hamiltonian transformations. It's just a fantastic book. The other two books to the right, the Book of Arnold and the Book of Abraham and Marsden, are representative of the way in which classical mechanics is formulated and developed in the research community nowadays. So if you go further in mechanics, you will want to become familiar with these books. They appeared in the late 70s. They're classics in the field. Um, whether one is better than another is a question of taste. Um, I get a lot of insight out of both. Both of them often have different emphasis on similar topics, and they cover some, some very different topics. So what are you going to get out of this course? Well, hopefully you have an idea up to this point. You're going to see how great scientists have transformed observations of nature into mathematical statements. And the graphic just below is, is Galileo's famous thought experiment on inclined planes which is how he arrived at uh, the law of inertia, or what we call Newton's first law. And that is very topical in all sorts of applications even today. Okay, so you're gonna learn how to turn observations into mathematics, and in the process, you're going to appreciate Leonardo's assertion that mechanics is an essential discipline that motivates many new developments and directions in mathematics. I want to end 
the overview part with uh, a quote of one of my favorite mathematical physicists of the 20th century, Paul Dirac, um, famous Bristolian, born in Bishopston in 1902. And Dirac was one of the architects of quantum mechanics. And this is a class on classical mechanics, but Dirac relied heavily on his extensive knowledge of classical mechanics. He brought the theory of Poisson brackets, related them to the commutators, the transformation theory of Hamiltonian dynamics in general. He brought the principle of least action from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, ultimately leading to Feynman's notion of a path integral, which plays fundamental roles in time-dependent uh, quantum mechanics. And I end with this quote, which I love. I consider that I understand an equation when I can predict the properties of the solution without actually solving it. So, I want to talk a little bit about the book, which you can get from the website. I gave you earlier. There are 11 chapters and we will go through all 11. The, now I will have probably two to three videos on each chapter. There's a prelude chapter which I'm not going to go into in, in hardly any detail. I talk about Newton's laws, what they mean, the original formulation, and the difficulty with the language and trying to determine what he meant by the language, how you turned it into mathematics. I rely heavily on Sommerfeld's description of Newton's laws in this description. I talk about what we mean by, by mass, um, length or position, and time. Um, those are fairly deep ideas, but in this course, they're going to have meaning because we can measure them. And I talk about what that means in the prelude. But in general, people regard mechanics as being divided into two parts. Kinematics, or the description of motion, and dynamics, the cause of motion. So we're going to start off in the first four chapters developing kinematics, vector calculus, the notion of a vector. Uh, and we'll end that with the notion of a line integral. Now, line integrals at this level tend to cause students some difficulties. So we're going to spend a lot of time on them about exactly what it means. And that's, that's an important statement. What does a line integral mean? So we're going to learn how to set them up, how to compute them, and some of their basic properties. And then we're going to go into dynamics, dynamics of a particle in one dimension, whatever dimension may mean. Projectiles, constrained motion and friction. Now we're going to meet Galileo's inclined plane, chapter seven, work, one of my favorite topics, and the rate of doing work, power. Then chapter eight, conservation laws, wonderful things. Conservation of energy and momentum, we're going to derive them. Here we're going to use work and line integrals. Then in chapter nine, uh, we're going to that's going to be concerned with an exam with a phase plane for one dimensional motion. This is generally not taught in a course like this, but it's something you're really going to use a lot, especially the way mechanics has developed and ordinary differential equations from the dynamical systems viewpoint. Chapter 10, we'll look at the phase plane for the simple pendulum, uh, a great example, which also has many, many different applications. And finally, in 11, Kepler comes back. We'll talk about the motion in a central force field, which is not just about astronomy, but comes up in nuclear physics, in uh, chemistry, all kinds of applications. So that's the program for this course. One of my favorite courses to teach. No matter how many times I teach it, I still like it. It's fresh and I learn something new. And hopefully you will too. So next time, we'll start with chapter one, kinematics, the notion of a vector. We'll see you next time.